<laughs> Amen. Praise God. Well, wonderful to be with you this morning. Um, it's a pleasure and a privilege to be asked to share the Word of God um, with us this morning. So, um, praise God. Amen. Amen. Let's just open with a word of prayer. Father, we give you thanks this morning. We give you praise. Oh, Father, we thank you for all the good things that you're doing in our lives, all the good things that you've done in our lives. We thank you, Father, for Jesus. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for what that means to us. We thank you for the resurrection. We thank you for the new life that you've put within us. We thank you for all that you've done and all that you're doing and all that you're going to do in Jesus' name. And we bless you this morning and we honor you. And we just say, we, we're so thankful for what you've done, and we're so looking forward to what you're doing and what you're going to do in our lives, in Jesus' name. Jesus, we honor you. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. And we thank you for having your way among us this morning, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can you turn to Psalm 118? And perhaps while you're turning, I'm going to tell you a little joke. I haven't told a joke in a long time. Um, uh, this guy went in to see the Pope because he heard the Pope had the red telephone, direct li- a direct line to God. And he said, I've heard you've got the uh, red telephone, the direct line to God. How much will it cost me to make a call? And he said, it'll cost you 10 euros. Okay, right, 10 euros. So, so he popped over to the States and he went into the White House and he talked to Joe Biden. And he said, I heard that you have the red telephone, the direct line to God. How much is it going to cost me to make a phone call? to God, and he said, well, it'll cost you $10. But I do have the red telephone, I do have that direct line, but it will cost you 10 So he came over to England, and he asked the king, used to be the queen, this is an old joke, I've had to modify it. <laughs> How much would it cost me to make a, a phone call to God, because I heard you have the red telephone, you've got the direct line to God. And what he says, it'll, it'll cost you 10 pounds, you know, my best English accent. Yeah. Right. <laughs> So he came over to Ireland. Where else? And he went to see our president, Michael D. Higgins, in Oris and And he said, um, Mr. Higgins, I heard that you have the red telephone direct line to God. I'd like to make a phone call. How much would it cost me? And he said, well, 10 cents. Wow, 10 cents. Yeah, that's all. Well, he said, the Pope said it was going to take 10 euros. And Joe Biden said $10. And King Charles said 10 pounds. You're just saying 10 cents. Well, he said, yeah, but he says, but from here, it's a local call. <laughs> so, so, I'd like to talk on calling on God this morning. And from here, it really is a local call. And it doesn't even cost 10 cents, because Jesus paid for it. Amen? We have direct access. We have access to the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of God. Amen? We have direct access. No, no fee. We can call upon God. Amen? So if I was going to say that God had a telephone number, I would say it's 1185. You might say, why would you say 1185? Well, just, you've opened your Bibles at Psalm 118, so let's read. Psalm 118, verse 5. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Let Israel now say, his mercy endures forever. Let the house of Aaron now say, his mercy endures forever. Let those who fear, who worship the Lord. That means fear, that means worship the Lord. That's what we did this morning, we worship the Lord. Now say, his mercy endures forever. And here the psalmist in verse 5 says, I called upon the Lord in distress, in a tight place. And the Lord answered me and set me in a large place. Praise God. Amen. Verse 6, the Lord is on my side, I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is for me among those who help me. Therefore, I shall see my desire on those who hate me. It is better to trust in the Lord and to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord and to put confidence in princes. Amen. Praise God for his word. Amen. And, uh, you know... This word said here, I called upon the Lord. Just, it's a little bit misleading. It does mean we call on the Lord. And we can, there are times in our life where we call on God in desperation. And that's okay. And that's fine. And God answers that. But here in this, in this particular instance, this word called has another meaning. And as I looked it up, it says, 
And that word there, it means to read aloud. It means to proclaim. It means to announce. It means to decree. So when the psalmist was calling upon the Lord, he was calling upon the Lord, but he was decreeing God's word. He was reading aloud the psalms. He was announcing what God had already said. He was proclaiming the promises of God. So when we're calling on God, very often times there's a temptation and we do sometimes be desperate. We call upon God. Have you ever done that? God, where are you? And you know, and God is right with us, amen? The Bible says he's in us. He's with us. He, has, he would never leave us or forsake us. So, but when we call upon God, we need to call upon him using his word. There are many times in my life when I've called upon God in desperation where I have I've been countering a situation where I've been in an area of distress, where I've been in, an, in, a, in this tight place where I couldn't see a way out of it. Um, you know, where, where something that came into my life, not necessarily of my own making, sometimes yes, sometimes my own making, but sometimes it just comes in through maybe a family member or comes in through a situation, a circumstance comes upon us, we get a bad report from the doctor, we get a, you know, we get a, a, a report that our loved one is, is struggling in an area. We can often struggle in areas ourselves and we, we're tempted to think, how will I ever get out of this tight place? It's constricting. This is where the psalmist found himself. He found himself in this place where it was tight. Have you ever heard that expression says, money is tight at the moment? The situation is restricting at the moment. I feel I'm literally just being closed in. I feel I'm being constricted in this situation and I don't see a way out. Well, I have good news for you this morning. We've all, if, you, if you're in that place this morning, God has got a way out for you. There is a way out for us out of every constricting situation, out of every situation that we might find ourselves in that tries to put us down. Amen? Can you say amen? Amen. 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 Um, I remember when I was in, in, in Balance Low, because I lived in a different town before I came here. I came down here in 1992. John came down a good bit before that. But I do remember, you know, as a Christian, feeling so constricted. Um, you know, just no fellowship, no, no Bible church, no, no place where I could express my Christianity. And I remember coming down and coming among like, like-minded believers here in this church, and I just remember hearing the truth of God's word in a new way begin to open me up, begin to bring in realms of freedom into my life, begin to kind of just... I began to blossom under the word of God. Can you identify with that? Have you ever heard the word of God come to you and all of a sudden it begins to change your life? It begins to open you up. It begins to kind of bring fruitfulness into your life. I was talking to Michael recently. Myself and Michael go way back and I remember being in a meeting in his hometown. A young Christian and I was really struggling because I knew I had changed. I knew I was saved. I, I knew I had the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And this joy was bubbling up, all the time wanting to get out, all the time wanting to express itself. But I had heard, you know, that, that I was a sinner. And that, you know, that sin would, would basically just, you know, um, stop the power of God in my life. And that God really didn't want anything to do with me if I was in sin. And I was still coming out of this old world. I was still coming out of the area where I was in, where, where, where we lived. We lived in that world where we just, well, sin was second nature, wasn't it? You know, we did, we, did, we did things, we went to the pub, we went to the, we did all the things we were doing. And, but yet this new life was inside and it was beginning to kind of just conflict with this old life. And yet I was so condemned. And the devil had convinced me that I had committed the unpardonable sin. You know, and the devil convinced me that God hated me. And God he was only tolerating me and, you know, I'd, I'd, go to, I'd go to hell. Even though I knew I had changed. And I remember going up to this man in this meeting and I remember saying, this is a man of God. He will be able to help me. He'll be able to give me an answer. And you know, he just, bless him, and it's no harm to him, and it's, he just wasn't able to. He just said, you know, just keep trusting God. He wasn't able to give me any way out of it. So condemned I was. And I remember when I came into the teaching of who I was in Christ and who Christ was in me, I remember coming into that as I came here and I heard the word of God. It just liberated me. And all of a sudden, these things that I tried to give up just began to fall away as I received the word of God. 
as the truth of God just came into my life, these things began to fall away naturally, almost, you know, just of themselves. So when I, when I say calling on God, I used to do a lot of calling on God. Where are you, God? Where are you? Where are you? You know, but I never got very far with that prayer. That prayer, never, I never got very far with it. It always just seemed to go so far and I, I'd get some relief, but it would never get an answer. And it wasn't until I started calling on God and quoting his word to him that I began to get answers, that I began to see breakthroughs, that I began to see, you know what? God responds to his word. God watches over his word to perform it. Amen? He's watching over his word. That's a, that's a wonderful scripture. It says there in Jeremiah 1.12, Then said the Lord to me, You have seen well, for I am alert and active, watching over my word to perform it. When we come to him and we call upon him and we bring his word to him, God is watching over that word. He's alert and he's active to that word. Can you say amen? amen. He is. Amen. Do you know what? It's not really about us at all, is it? It's not about us. It's about him. It's about his word. And his word, I felt just this came to me, his word in our mouths gets his attention. His word in our mouths gets his attention. And of course, his will for us is to bring us out into this large place. His will for us is to take us out of this area where we're bound, where we're restricted, where we feel we're just clamped down, where we can't express ourselves, where things are not working out. God's will for us this morning is to bring us out into a place of abundance, to bring us out into a place of liberty. Amen? To bring us out into a place of freedom. In fact, one of the, one of the translations of that word there, bringing us out into a large place, uh, the, message, the message Bible says, he's bringing us out into a place of untrammeled freedom untraveled freedom so you know we've all attained to a level of freedom this morning we've all come uh, to a place in God where we're experiencing freedom where we're experiencing uh, realms of freedom that we haven't before but how many know there's much more for us there's more for us in God amen? amen we're on a journey and we haven't reached the end yet can you say amen to that We've started, and we put, but you know what? We're on this journey, this journey of enlargement, where God is taking us from this place where a man that talks almost like a black hole, where all of this cloud, all of this, this negative circumstance, whatever the situation is going on in your life right now, in your life this morning, I want to give you hope. I want to speak to you and speak into your heart and plant a seed of hope that whatever the situation is in your life now, I'm saying under the authority of the Spirit of God that God is going to bring you out into a large place, a place of untrammeled freedom, a place of victory, a place of liberty, a place of abundance, a place of healing, a place of deliverance. Whatever the circumstance that's going on in your life right now, Whatever is going on in your family's life, in your loved one's life, whatever the situation, I want you to lift your eyes off of that and I want you to put it on the Lord and I want you to put it on his word and I want you to remember that it is the Lord that is going to bring you out and bring you into a place of victory and bring you into a place of untrammeled freedom. Amen? Untrammeled freedom. Scripture says it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Can you say amen? It is for freedom, praise God. Do not accept anything but full and utter freedom in the kingdom, praise God. That's who we are designed to be. That is who we are called to be. We are called to come out of these dark places into his marvelous light. It says there in 1 Peter 2.9, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may what? Complain how bad the situation is. Is that what it says? Did I get that wrong? That you might proclaim, amen? amen. Not complain, that you might proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And you know, as I read that, I meditated on that, I saw the connection. Before there's the marvelous light, before there's the freedom, there's the proclamation. And you see that? Before the liberty comes the proclamation. And you know what? This morning I want you to realize, I want you to recognize again that you are a royal priest. You are a holy nation. 
Praise God. Turn to your neighbor and say, you look royal this morning. Amen. Amen. So what do kings do? What do kings do? They decree. They make rulings. And their rulings are final, at least in the old days, right? Kings decree things. And we are a royal priesthood called out to proclaim the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Praise God. I believe this is a scripture that we need to get a hold of again. Um, we need to get a hold of that again. You know, there's a scripture in, in, in this one here. We kind of think of that that's optional, but that's not optional. We are actually, we're actually not doing our duty as believers, as royal priests, if we're not proclaiming the truth of the word of God over our lives, over our families, over our church, over our community, over our nation, and the things that are happening in this world. Amen? We have been given an awesome amount of authority. And I think we underestimate it. I don't think we realize it. But I believe we're going to get a revelation of that this morning. We're going to begin to see in our own lives that as we declare and decree the word of God, liberty is going to come forward. Liberty is going to come forward. Amen? Freedom is going to be coming into view in Jesus' name. Whatever the issue is going on in your life right now, I prophesy liberty and freedom is coming in, in Jesus' name. We all go through times of, t- of, of testing. We all go through t- trials. Myself and Rachel have been through a particularly tough trial in the last couple of years. Um, and I won't go into detail because it's not necessary. You know, it was just uh, something that wasn't of our own making and all of that. It was a family issue. And, uh, but that was a particularly tough time for us. And I have to say, you know, the body of Christ the, here in, 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 in my local church have been a real blessing, a real support. And, um, you know, one of the things it says there, the, the, the psalmist said, you know, that God is for me among those who help me. Amen. Thank God for a good church. Thank God for good believers. Thank God for those that stand with us. Amen? Amen. Thank God for people that will pray for us. And I can say that God was with me among those who helped me. And I want to get, you know, I, I don't need to go into detail, but we're, we're still coming out of that, you know. Um, it's in relation to my son and just some, some, some tough situations he got into financially and it really, really did bring an awful lot of pressure. But God has been so faithful and God has brought and is bringing us out. Can you say amen? Yes. And you know one thing that really has kept me buoyant in that and kept Rachel buoyant is our confession of the word of God. That God, no matter what happens, you're bringing us out to rich fulfillment. Amen. You're bringing us out. Amen. We're going to have a testimony. Amen. You're going to have a testimony. Amen. Whatever you're going through today, whatever it is, God is aware of it, and you will have a testimony. And I like one of the versions of that scripture there in 1 Peter 2, 9, where it says that we might proclaim the praises of God. Another version that says we might show forth the praises of God. We're just not going to proclaim it. We're going to show it. Amen? It's going to be seen in our lives. God wants it to be seen so we have a testimony to our community, a testimony to each other that if God can do it for him, if God can do it for her, God can do it for me. Praise God. So I want to increase your hope this morning. I want you to be, get your hope stirred up that God has a good, large place of abundance for you, no matter what you're going through. Can you say amen? amen? And you know what? It says in It's important what we say when we worship the Lord. It says, let those who fear the Lord, let those who worship the Lord now say, praise God. And you know, it's very important once we worship the Lord that we're careful of what we say because we have the Lord's attention when we worship him. Can you say amen? He's listening to us. So it is important what you say. So this is what what the psalmist says. He says, oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Let Israel now say, His mercy endures forever. Let the house of Aaron now say, His mercy endures forever. Let your house say, His mercy endures forever. Put your name in there, your family in there, and let your family say, and let you say on behalf, His mercy endures forever. Praise God. Forever. Now, you know when we get saved, we make mistakes. We think, well, His mercy just goes up to that point. It doesn't. It goes forever. It goes from now until eternity. It never stops. His mercy endures forever. 
forever. Praise God. It didn't say when you sin, it stopped. It didn't say when you made a mistake. It didn't say when you failed. Whatever it is, his mercy endures forever. And let those who worship the Lord now say his mercy endures forever. So as we call upon the Lord, let's come and let's proclaim, let's announce, let's read aloud the word to him. He loves to hear his word being read back to him because it takes faith and faith pleases God. Can you say amen? Faith pleases God. And faith itself has a substance to it. Would we quote God's word? It is not just like any other word. It's not like any other word that you've ever read in any other book. It is powerful. It has an impact on our life. It changes things. In effect, it is a spiritual weapon. It is the sword of the spirit that we are told to yield against the enemy. The word of God itself has intrinsic power in it to cause itself to come to pass in your life. So when you quote God's word, you're just not quoting any other word that you've heard or any other thing that you've read or what someone has said to you, quoting the very substance of God. Faith is the substance of things hope for. It's real. It's not just words spoken into the air. These words have power. They have substance and meaning and they have an impact on the devil. They have an impact on the situations in your life. You're not quoting any other thing. You're quoting God's word. And God's word in your mouth gets God's attention. He watches over that word to what? Perform it. Praise God. And if you think back through your life, everything that you've experienced in God, you know, even from mean salvation, you confessed. You asked him to come in. He came in. You confessed him as Lord. A transaction happened. The Holy Spirit made his home within you. I remember in my own life, you know, as a young believer, just coming into different truths. And I have to say, you know, and it's been said here before, that the things that have made the biggest difference in my life, uh, apart from being saved and being baptized in the Holy Spirit, is revelation in the Word. I've had more growth in my life. I've had more advancement. I've had more victory in areas that I've prayed for and that I've confessed God's Word as a result of getting a hold of God's Word and getting a revelation, progressive revelation. I've had more victories and breakthroughs in my life than I ever had and just calling out to God and saying, where are you? Guess what? God's not lost. Amen? He's not lost. He knows where he is. He knows where he is. And they were told in, in Romans 10, or in 6 verse 10, it says, but what does the righteousness of faith say? It says this, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who will ascend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. It says, don't say that. And many of us, and I know we've all said it, if only Jesus would come down. If only the Lord would walk into the room and I could have a conversation with him. But you know, here scripture tells us not to say that. Don't say that. It says, but what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. This is the word of faith which we preach. Praise God. And you know, some people might look at that and they might say, oh, I'd rather have a talk with Jesus. Well, what Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father, he's not coming down. He's just finished. He's, he's not coming down. He's sent his word to you. And he said, the word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. In your mouth and in your heart. Praise God. In your mouth and in your heart. So don't say if he was here, because he's given you his word, and that's what we, have, that's what we will say, and that's what we are supposed to say. Amen. And I remember coming into, the, in, in, uh, coming into a place where um, and we, we had a little meeting in our house in my hometown and that. And we were just young Christians, you know what I mean? We were just had a little Bible study. And I remember a man came and uh, uh, Tom Hollywood came. And I remember Tom sharing with us about the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Never heard about that before. Never knew anything about that. And... Uh, taught us over a few weeks and I remember that, exp- that, ex- that saying to Tom Tom is that something then that we have to that we can have and Tom says yeah that is something that we can have and that you should have 
And he said, but many people in my church don't even believe that. Don't even believe that. We never even heard of it. But you know what? When I heard that, I believed it. I said, I want that. And I thought that. And you know what happened to me? I received the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And that revolutionized my life. And that changed my life. And that brought realms of victory. And that brought realms of freedom to my life that I had not before. Released me in so many areas. But you know, up to that point, I didn't know anything about it. I didn't know anything about it. And you know, Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. I was set free in that area. I was set free in that area. My emotions were set free. My joy was released. I hadn't had it before. I was saved. I knew it. But for some reason, I wasn't able to enjoy the full experience of it. So I thank God for people that came into my life. And later on, another, another man, a man called Ken Ashworth came into my life. He had a church in Athlone called Athlone Christian Centre. And I remember coming under the teaching of Kenneth Hagen. And, uh, you know, the, the revelation that who Christ is in you and who you are in Christ Jesus. And what, God loves you, that revelation. And, and God is for you. And I remember coming under that teaching. And I remember freedom coming as a result of that. And bondage is falling off. Again, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. So ignorance is not bliss in the kingdom of God. Ignorance is not bliss. We need to progressively come to know the truth of God. And we never stop on that journey. We never stop. We will always be getting greater revelation, coming into a greater understanding of the truths of God, and thus becoming more free and more liberated. Can you say amen? amen. Praise God. And I know we can all do with more freedom. Because the fear of man, what does it do? Brings a snare. I mean, I was just standing there this morning and I was just, um, I felt the Holy Spirit just say, Pat, kneel and worship the Lord. And all of a sudden, the fear of man, what would people think of me if I kneel down? And I didn't, you know? Because, you know, you, you, you're, you're conscious of other people. And then I turned and I just looked in Jean, and here she was kneeling, worshipping the Lord. And I, and I said, Lord, forgive me. You know, forgive me for being just so impressed with other people and what they might think. Uh, it's what you think. And I, I knelt in prayer. If the Holy Spirit leads you to do that, don't feel you have to do it if he doesn't do it. But for me, I felt that I needed to do that, and I did. So I repented, amen? And uh, I, felt, I felt okay again, fine. There's no, there's no condemnation, okay? But we were so impressed with other people. Let's be impressed with, 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 with God, amen? Let's be impressed with his word. Amen. Hebrews 4 verse 12 says, For the word of God is living, powerful, active, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of spirits, of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. I love that. It's powerful. It's active. Even when we don't think anything is happening, the Word of God is active. When we pray, the Word of God is now active. You can't see a change. You don't see something that's happening on the surface. You're looking, I don't see any change, Lord. The Word of God is active. It doesn't matter what you see. It doesn't matter what you feel. The Word of God is active in that situation. He sent His Word and healed me and delivered me from my destructions. Praise God. He sent his word and healed us and delivered us from our destructions. No matter what we feel, no matter what it looks like, we are delivered, we are healed. Can you say amen? amen. I remember, I won't go into detail about it, I've shared it before, my own testimony of just having a severe breakdown before I got married. This was a long time ago, 28 years, 29 years ago. And for me, a, a very devastating time in my own life. And could not get any where I went for a lot of prayer, a lot of ministry, but couldn't get any release on it. But for me, key in that was the revelation where God spoke to me. True, true word in the scripture that God has not given me a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. And I held on to that for days, for weeks, and I just quoted that scripture so many times until I began to be come out of that darkness and just come in again to freedom in my mental health. Praise God. In my mental health. And I often say it was almost like I was at the bottom of a 
real tube station. You know these, these metro stations where you're way, way down at the bottom and you can just see a chink of light up there? And for me, as I just confessed that and just uh, stayed in faith, I began, it just seemed to me like I began to get on the first rung of the escalator and hope each day I just get a bit further, further towards that, towards that light, towards that place of freedom now. It wasn't overnight. It wasn't even over a week. It wasn't over a month. It actually took several months for me to come out to a place where I felt I was sane again. I used to say to Rachel, there are people saner than me in the psychiatric hospital. And it was true. I was held up. Rachel basically just, just kept me together. The word of God, those that helped me, my, my wife, my church, and uh, praise God, I came through. Amen? I came out into a place of freedom. And I enjoy that freedom today. And I say that just to encourage you. And I say that to anyone that's struggling this morning. Don't underestimate the power of God's word. I feel we do that. We underestimate. We underestimate the power in God's word. We get so familiar with it, I think, at times. We quote scriptures like Jeremiah 27, verse 11. For I know the thoughts that I have towards you. Thoughts of peace. Thoughts, good thoughts, to give you a future and a hope. And we, we, we get so familiar with scriptures like that that we forget that it's actually a scripture. It's true. Jeremiah 27, verse 11 is a scripture as John 3, 16. Would you agree? It is the word of God. And that's what God wants us to do. He knows the thoughts. But I feel and I'm convinced that we need to know his thoughts. And we need to experience the thoughts that he has towards us and come out of this area of freedom because he has realms of freedom for us that we haven't experienced yet that he wants to bring us into. So don't underestimate the power of proclamation. Don't ne neglect your, priestly, high pr your, your royal priestly duty to proclaim the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We're called out to that place. I'm reminded of the story of Jonah in um, uh, Jonah chapter 1. And if you just uh, put that up there, Isabella. Jonah chapter 2, verse 7 to 10. And you know the story of Jonah. He, God had asked him to go and preach in Nineveh. He had gone, he gone and asked him to preach the gospel and to share the good news that God loved these people. He didn't want to answer the call. He actually wanted these people just to experience the judgment of God rather than the, the blessing of God. But he wound up in a very, very tight place. He wound up in the belly of a fish. Now, I've been in a few tight places, and I dare say you have, but I don't think any of us have been in the belly of a whale. Hands up anyone who's been in that place. I don't see... If you, that, that is one tight place. Could you agree? Could you imagine? And he says here in verse 7, My soul fainted within me, but I remember the Lord. While he was in the belly of the fish, of the whale, and he says, My prayer went up again into your holy temple. Those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy. You know, if we regard the situation where there's a danger, we can miss the mercy that God would bring to us in it because we're more preoccupied with the situation than we are with the promise of God. Those who regard lying vanities is another rendition of it. Forsake the mercy that could be there. So don't let us as individuals, don't let that be you where you're so enamored or you're so caught up with the situation that you miss the blessing that the Lord wants to bring to you. Those who regard worthless idols forsake the mercy that could be theirs. But I will, and this is a declaration, Jonah engaged his will. He said, but I will sacrifice to you with a voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. And verse 10 says, so the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Praise God. You know, as we begin again to thank God, as we begin to look to him, take our eyes off the situation, whatever it is, whatever the negative situation is, whatever is constricting or confining us, whatever is hemming us in and blocking us from the freedom that we know we can have in Christ, as we get our eyes off that again and begin to thank him and to praise him and proclaim 
the promises of God over our life, the situation itself that's clinging to us, and get so tired of us, so, uh, you know, uh, upset with us quoting that it will begin to remove itself from our life. It, in a sense, it'll vomit us away, praise God. It will begin to detach itself and we will begin to experience freedom. We will begin to experience that large place that God wants to bring us into. I could imagine Jonah after being in that belly of the whale. Could you imagine the seaweed around his head? You know, he's bleached white from the digestive gases in the whale's belly. And he comes, and all of a sudden he's belched up onto this dry land. Now he has a message to preach to the people. Now he has a testimony. And he goes to the people of Nineveh and he says, repent. And if you saw someone like Jonah, what would you do? I'd, re- I'd repent. <laughs> But the point is, he came, he was put onto that dry land. He was put onto that place. Paul, after all he'd been through in the book of Acts, we read in the very last chapter, it says that for two years he dwelt in his own rented house, preaching the gospel, receiving all that came towards him, no man forbidding him. And he spoke concerning the things of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God. So even took him from a prison, he appealed to Caesar, and even right at the end, He was in a place of fruitfulness, a place of ministry, a place where no man was forbidding him. Isn't that a wonderful thing? That right before he went to be with the Lord, he was experiencing freedom in God. He was experiencing that large place. No matter what, God will bring us out. Amen? And Jesus said to the the disciples, go into the city. You will find a place and go up. You'll find a large room prepared furnished there make ready for us to eat Passover Jesus has that place for us furnished prepared ready for you for fellowship to receive his goodness to receive his bounty to receive that place of freedom that large place didn't say a small room it said a large room praise God so let's get our hope up this morning let's get our vision off of the situations negative situations that can be in our lives from time to time. They come to us all. But, praise God, let's remember what we are to say. Let's go back again and just just stand and declare. I want you to just stand with me this morning, if you would, as as we finish. And I want you to just say after me, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his mercy endures forever. Let Israel now say, say, His mercy endures forever. forever. Let the house of Aaron now say, His mercy endures forever. Let Let my house now say, His mercy endures forever. As for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. Let those who worship the Lord now say, say, His mercy endures forever. forever. Father, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the untrammeled freedom and victory that you have for each one of us, for each person in our family, for every circumstance that's in our lives right now. We thank you that you are bringing us out and putting us into that place, setting us in as we choose to look to you, as we choose to speak your word, as we choose to proclaim and announce and decree the word of God over our lives, the promise of God. If it's healing, if it's deliverance, if it's financial, if it's marital, relational, whatever the situation is, Father, we choose this day whom we will serve. And we choose to serve the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. I appreciate you this morning. Thank you for your time. And be blessed in Jesus' name.